right, so we're gonna go ahead and start this morning's presentation. So Evan, are you on the line with us this morning? I am, Mara. good morning. Good morning, thank you. So everyone, I'm gonna um, introduce Evan Feynman, who is the Governor's Chief Broadband Advisor. Thank you, Evan. Thank you very much, Mara, and thank you everybody for uh, joining us by phone or by video. Um, if you uh, are here today, it's because you are interested in availing yourself of a uh, VADI grant and uh, that alone makes you a really important part of this shared endeavor that we all have to try to finally put to rest the, the digital divide and the, the harm it's causing uh, our economies and our societies and our kids and our veterans and our elderly folks. Uh, it's really hard to, to explain to people for whom broadband is an assumed uh, availability how tough it is for folks who don't have it and how many ways it can affect the community. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just a couple of brief uh, things to point out. First, uh, I encourage uh, everybody to go to the uh, Commonwealth Connect website and you can reach that at commonwealthconnect.virginia.gov. There you can find all kinds of resources that will help you and your community uh, take on this challenge and better approach uh, your VADI application. Uh, second, I want to remind everybody that we have a goal that was laid out by Governor Northam in 2018 of universal coverage. And uh, the only way we're going to get there is if you all join with us and put forward big, bold, ambitious proposals. Don't assume that, uh, you know, your idea is too big or too costly. Please, you know, let us uh, uh, let, let us advise you on that. But don't 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 negotiate against yourself. Uh, and then finally, just a little discussion of the scope that's remaining. Um, if you read the most recent version of the Commonwealth Connect report, uh, we have a pretty high confidence in our scoping of the problem that remains. We believe there's right around 350,000 home and business connections that need to be made for us to uh, credibly claim that we've uh, got universal coverage. And um, that number is significantly smaller than it was before uh, Governor Northam took office. I think we should all be uh, incredibly grateful that, that the governor chose to make this such a significant priority right at the outset of his uh, uh, inauguration. Uh, 108,000 homes and businesses have a uh, broadband connection today that would not have it, uh, but for, or, or, or at least have the, we're in construction, you know, the, the projects have begun to get them those connections. It would not have them, but for the governor making this a priority. And so, uh, now that we're into the COVID crisis, it's obviously uh, elevated in importance. And uh, I, again, commend everybody for being uh, on this webinar today. Uh, and please don't hesitate to reach out. I know that uh, Tammy and Tamara and Caroline will all are, are all incredibly approachable and helpful. And I don't think anybody would be nervous about asking them for additional assistance. But just don't assume that uh, we're not all here to help you. So if you've got any question, large or small, reach out to me, reach out to anybody else on this webinar. Uh, reach out to anybody else on the Commonwealth Connect team. Uh, we are here to support you. We want your projects to be successful. And uh, I look forward to reading them. I'm really excited to see what comes in. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, we have uh, at least $19 million to uh, deploy in this round, uh, but there is the, every opportunity or every possibility that we'll have uh, additional funds, whether through uh, federal dollars or a plussing up of state resources in the forthcoming uh, rebudget round. And so, you know, I don't I don't want anybody to think that because of the COVID crisis, uh, you should in any way deviate from what I was saying earlier. Bring us big, ambitious proposals. Uh, don't shy away from uh, swinging for the fences. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Tamara. Thank you, Evan, for that wonderful welcome message. Um, just a couple of housekeeping tips, please, as you um, have questions for the team regarding what we're presenting on this morning, please type them in the chat box. We want to hold all questions so we can go over them at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you are familiar with Google Hangouts, you'll see to the right of your screen, you'll see a tab where you can see all the people, and then you'll see a tab where you can click on for chat. You can access the chat box there and type your questions in there throughout the presentation. And again, at the end of the presentation, when Tammy hands off to Caroline, we will answer both the questions in the chat box and then 
allow our friends that are on the phone to ask any questions as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. All right. So the Vati program, as Evan just shared, is at right, right now we're at level funding at $19 million. And the purpose of the program is to provide financial assistance to supplement construction costs by private sector providers to extend service to areas that are presently unserved by any broadband provider. And as Evan shared and we shared on, on a variety of calls, um, this is a goal of Governor Northam for functional universal coverage in the Commonwealth of Virginia. All right, so just to share some stats with you all um, on the program, and Evan talked a little bit about this earlier, we've awarded since the inception of the program in 2017, $25 million to 29 localities, of which allowed 53,000, over 53,000 Virginians, residents, businesses, and anchors to have access to broadband speeds greater than 25 over three. And when we look back at the actual deployment speeds, they vary from 10 over three all the way up to two gigabits. Um, we've had a lot of stakeholder involvement um, this year around the VATI guidelines that we published in April this year. We held three different input sessions on the 14th, 23rd, and 27th of April. We had over 100 folks participate. And just um, in case you all didn't know, we received 92 written, 92 comments from 25 unique sources from both the input sessions as well as written comments. They were all due by May 18th. And just to share, share you all, that was a, a goal, that actually was an interesting um, accomplishment. The most comments we've gotten since the inception of the BOTSI program. So thank you all for um, participating in the input sessions and providing us feedback on how we can make the program better. All right, so new for 2021. Um, so we've decided to, the unserved areas are now defined as having broadband speeds at, at or below 25 over three. Um, and then just so, so you all know, um, in the original draft guidelines, we received a lot of comments on the definition of unserved. And Tammy will go over this more in the, in the more the application portion of the presentation. But we wanted to just pull out those things that, that were high level changes that were made to the program. Um, we also recommend that while anyone that's submitting a wireless project, that we encourage you to contact our office. Um, Evan talked about the team being available to provide technical assistance. So we specifically, uh, we want everyone to reach out to us for TA, but we definitely want to hear from our wireless uh, applicants that are thinking about submitting an application so we can talk about um, just ways to structure the project, just to the inherent nature of wireless projects and the overlap. Um, the private co-applicant must contribute a cash match. This was actually something added by the General Assembly this year to the VATI enabling language. Um, and we set that bar at 10%. Um, we are asking that if any provider is unable to provide the 10% match, that they must demonstrate that the private investment, um, the, un the inability to provide the 10% match requirement, um, must be related to whether the density or the scope of the project. So please, again, reach out to us to talk to us about your project. Um, also, we've added a new question, which Tammy will go into more detail on, um, details on items being leveraged for the project. And um, I don't want to steal Tammy's thunder, so I won't give you any ideas on that. But there are ways both through federal resources as well as local resources to leverage um, to strengthen your VATI application as well. And then we've changed the public notice to a VATI notice of application. This was actually a comment we received during the public comment period. Um, you know, we've gone from a local public notice, um, then we've gone to sending it to us as a public notice. So now we're changing it to just a notice of application and a sample can be found in the guidelines. And then the last piece um, for, that's new for 2021 is planned service is eligible for a challenge if state or federal funds have been awarded. And then um, we'll provide some more guidance around maps. Tammy has some interesting information on um, some good and not so good maps. So again, I don't want to steal her thunder. All right. Just wanted to share with you the timeline. So we've already um, completed everything through the month of May based on our original timeline. And today is our how to apply webinar. And just the, the last couple of things, the application is due on the 17th of August. That has been our original deadline and we have not um, changed that as of right now. So August 17th is our deadline. And then um, your, your notice of intent to apply, which is the, the VATI notice of application is gonna be due July 13th. 
then we'll post that information on our website on the 17th. And then um, we will go through the challenge process for between August and November. All right, so just to share a little bit on the VASI program, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Tammy. Tammy, you ready? I am here, Tamara. Hopefully everybody can hear me at this point. And um, so as always, um, we wanted to make sure everybody understood who were the eligible applicants. Um, the applicants have to be a unit of local government. Uh, so towns, cities, counties, EDA, IDAs, um, uh, broadband and wireless authorities, planning district commissions, school divisions, etc. They must have a private sector provider as the co-applicant. So the private sector provider cannot be the applicant. They have to be a co-applicant. And um, so if anybody has any questions or are unsure if your unit of government is applied, again, please don't reach, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, to our next slide, please. All right, so um, we have four application components. Um, they're broken down into demonstrated need, project readiness, budget and cost appropriateness, and Commonwealth priorities. And we'll go through um, some details on the next couple of slides for each of these. So next slide, please, Tamara. Um, so we're going to start with the definition of unserved. We have uh, changed that this year. So an area with speeds of 25 Three or less than or equal to with a 10% service overlap within the project area. So we have proposed um, a different overlap stakeholder meetings. Uh, it, we've gone back to 10% overlap for all area, all project types, whether they're wireless or wireline. Um, however, we did change the definition of unserved to go up to 25.3 or less. However, areas lacking 10 over 1 will be given significant priority in the application scoring, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we um, get to our passing. So it will show you how we're going to uh, break that out a little bit. So next slide, please. All right. So hopefully you guys have the, um, the uh, got program guidelines and criteria in front of you so you can actually see the application questions as they will be in CAMS. Um, so under project area in need, we have the narrative description. Uh, this hasn't changed from previous years. Um, we are asking that you include a project area map. And some of the map examples later on will show you what we're really looking for. Um, then the second question is asking for the existing providers. Again, um, we want to make sure you're doing your due diligence and understand what providers are in that area. Are they offering those speeds? Um, because our, our object here is not um, existing infrastructure. Uh, our goal here is to hit the unserved um, areas. So um, the third question is a question that we've um, added this year and it's talking about existing federal funds. Um, we want to know that you know is CAF2 here, is ACAM here, is Reconnect here, is Community Connect here or near the project area um, because we understand that sometimes the census blocks are on one side of the street and not the other side of the street. So we want to make sure everybody knows who's spending what and um, then, Tamara, I'm going to turn this back to you to talk about RDOF because that is the, um, the new funds that are not going to be available until October. And I wanted you to um, help explain what we're doing with the um, RDOF auction. Okay. So, um, for those of you who are aware of the, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund program, um, that's a program that was actually launched in March with uh, by the FCC. And Given the fact that the, the timeline for Adolf is overlapping with the VATI timeline, we're asking that anyone that is going to apply for Adolf, um, particularly if you're applying for Adolf and you're, you want to leverage it, this is one of those things you can leverage um, with a potential VATI project, that you share that as part of your application. Um, as Tammy shared, sometimes the census blocks are overlapping, sometimes they're 
in the project area, but you're not seeking funds for that. Um, the art off bids are due in October. And if you looked at our timeline earlier, we will be in the middle of our challenge window at that time. So in the guidelines, and I don't remember, hold on, let me see what page it's on. We provided specific guidance on page eight regarding art off. And what we're basically saying is that um, art off, any event that art off funding is awarded, that art off will supersede the VATI program. Um, so if the project area, let's say you have a project area and it's 100 homes and art off um, is 60% of that project area. And by some form of fashion, the FCC awards and it awards an award for art off. So that 60% is actually now covered under art off. Well, because it's now under 50%, uh, we will allow that project to still stand within the VATI for consideration, but that project would definitely have to be rescoped. In the case that it's the reverse and the 60% is actually um, exceeds 50%, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. If the RDOF area exceeds 50% of a project area and the RDOF funding is awarded, we will no longer consider that VATI application for funding. However, if it's under 50%, and the persons, the community or the co-applicants able to leverage the art off money along with Vati, we will still let that application stand under review. So the, the, the line of demarcation for art off and Vati is at 50%. And again, more details are on page eight of the program guidelines. And if you all have any questions regarding that, definitely reach out to the team um, and also type a question in the chat box. All right, so Tammy, back to you. All right, thank you, Samara. Um, so then um, another component that's always been in there is the determination of unserved and anticipated overlap. Um, you know, that's why you've got, you have to figure out who's in your area, who's serving there. Um, you know, the goal of this is to have everybody try to talk to each other um, and try to figure out what that overlap is. Some of that can be, um, found on different various websites, um, you know, the FCC has data on their websites. I want to say it's a little bit older. I don't think they've put the 2019 data maps up yet. They have the 2018 maps. So um, it's going to take a little bit of research on everybody's um, behalf to try to figure out the determination of unserved and anticipated overlaps. Um, a lot of areas do know where they're, they're unserved. Um, because they have surveys out there, they've done um, plans, so um, this is going to be a little bit of legwork, but it's no different than it has been in previous years. Um, the next one is the total number of passings. So in previous years, we've split out from business passings, and I will have an example a little bit later on. We've created a new passings form um, that we are want everybody to fill out. Um, so we're going to look at residential passings. We're going to look at business non-home based. We're going to look at businesses home based, um, community anchors, and non-residential. And we have a definition for non-residential just to make sure everybody understands the difference between like a community anchor and a non-residential. And it, those are on page uh, 21 and 22 of the guidelines. So uh, we ask that you do look those over if you have any questions about that please don't hesitate again to reach out to us. And then um, deployment speeds. Uh, again, we are asking for uh, uh, you guys to look tiers of speeds. Um, one thing we are requesting is you must list your 25 over 3 speed with cost. If you do happen to be a provider that is only offering one speed, um, but are charging by um, you know, data downloads instead, please reach out to us so we can come up with a comparable answer. We're trying to just make sure we know what everybody's 25 over 3 um, cost is. That helps us um, when we're looking at the overall application. And then um, nothing that has changed from last year is the network design. Um, basically, we're looking for uh, the description of the network design, um, you know, what are the components, what are the ones that already exist, what are going to be added. And this is where you would add the propagation map if it is a wireless project. Um, one thing I didn't mention that I meant to mention at the beginning, um, if there are any attachments needed, um, 
we are we are asking that you label them a certain way and that this year all attachments are in PDF form uh, being, uh, a word document you can either do a uh, save as and change the format to PDF or if you go to print um, changing up the printer to uh, Microsoft uh, to PDF print is one way on word and on Excel, you have to be so careful on Excel if you are doing a workbook versus the sheets. Um, but again, the easiest way is on an Excel sheet, go to print, change it to a print to PDF, and you should have the ability to print either that worksheet or that workbook. If you are having issues with that, again, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can help you with that. Um, so if we could go on, we'll go on to the examples of uh, some maps. So turn on next slide, please. All right, so this is an example of a map um, that needs improvement. This is a wireless propagation. Um, I can't tell exactly where this is located. I, it's hard to read street names. It's hard to, um, I don't know what the red circle entails. It's a two mile radius, a four mile radius, a 10 mile radius. Um, so this doesn't help us try to narrow down that project area when we're looking at that overall project. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is an example of a detailed wireline map. Um, as you can see, the red outlines the project area. Um, the dots tell me, you know, what the customers are. The black dots. Tell me that they're sure, so it tells me maybe a home or some other business, um, you know, that are potential services there. And if we go to the last map here, next slide, Samara. Okay, um, this is an example of a detailed wireless map. Um, you know, it's telling me the blue dots are residential addresses, the pink dots are commercial addresses. You can kind of three, see three different propagation circles there with some overlap, but it's telling me that, you know, this tower has, this towers have a four mile buffer. So I know that the radius of that circle is four miles. So, you know, I can tell a lot of information from this map and I will say um, probably about 90 95% of all maps on the 2020 applications were really good. They were very detailed. They gave us information, and we could find out, um, you know, pretty easily where these were on a bit. On, you know, if we went to Google Maps ourselves or whatever, and we did some information looking into ourselves or transferring it to GIS. So these are the kinds of information we want. Um, you know, again, if you have questions about it, don't hesitate. Up, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So, um, next slide, please, Tamara. All right. So this is the new um, Sam. This is the passing form that we're like we're going to request everybody to use. And so, um, one thing I did not touch on, and I don't know why we didn't touch on this, um, is that for each application, you can um, have multiple non-contiguous areas as part of that application. So the sample passing form would be you do one for an overall area and three areas in your locality that are not contiguous. In addition to doing one overall form, you would do three separate forms, one for each area. And as you can see, we're breaking it out by residential, business non-home base, business home base, community anchors non-residential. And we're looking for like this whole area. And then we're looking at the numbers of where, with speeds at 10, 1, or below in that project area. So this is where we're um, being able to differentiate, you know, the priority for those 10, 1 speeds. Um, you, you know, if you guys have questions with the forms, you know, again, don't hesitate. We're here to help. But this way, it gives us a better idea and a better breakdown from an overall project perspective to each project area perspective. Also, um, next slide, please. All right, um, project readiness. Um, 
we always ask for the status of the development. You know, where is it in? Um, is it in planning? Is it preliminary engineering? You know, how far along are you on this project? Uh, one thing we are requiring this year is a copy of draft MOU, MOA, and the status of it. Um, so the locality might have a draft MOU, MOA, and the status is we have to um, our co-applicant or the um, co-applicant and applicant have agreed on the MOU, MOA, and are ready to sign if awarded. You know, that unfortunately happens to be one of the um, uh, things that hold up our grant. So uh, we want to make sure that we understand where you are in that process uh, with getting the um, contract out to you guys. Um, as always, project timeline is um, you know, is the including of the construction schedule. Um, what we add it works really well. Instead of, you know, figuring that the awards are going to be in January and you're going to start in February, do month one, month two, month three, month four, so that when um, you do, you know, if you do happen to get an award, that when we do a contract negotiation, we can fill in month one with whichever month we, is a reasonable start time there. And then um, the status of easements and permits. Um, usually, if you need easements, you don't need permits. Sometimes you do need both, or vice versa. You need permits and not easements. Let us know um, where they are. You know, it could be they're identified. We're not going to go after them until we are awarded. Um, you know. Permits especially, we know that they have uh, certain timelines on them and you don't want to put out ahead of them. But we want to know that you've looked at these project areas, you understand what's needed and the potential um, time it could take or any um, roadblocks that might be um, coming up if you are awarded this grant. Um, then the details on the matching funds, we asked for the um, uh, funding source table and um, documentation of matching funds. So, if you, um, you know, if the locality is putting in some, the um, co-applicant is putting in some. Maybe you have an IDA or an EDA that is going to put in some matching funds. We we need to know where all these matching funds come from. So. Um, you know, list everything out. Again, you know, if you have questions about stuff, um, don't, you know, please reach out to us. And then um, leverage. I just want to make sure everybody understands what leverage is. And so we put in a uh, definition of leverage, and it's non-match cash or non-match in-kind resources committed to a proposed project that do not qualify as match. So leverage could be the uh, federally funded projects. Like, you know, you have CAF2 in one census block, and you can leverage that to say, it, we're using the body funds to go to the census block right next door. Or um, we are getting a reduction in whole rent rentals, not necessarily a cash value that you can put into the match. Or are you getting volunteer labor from anywhere? Um, these are the kinds of things that uh, that are leverage, and that we can, um, you know, we can help you determine as you're working on the application if you have any questions about it. Um, marketing plan. Last year it was under um, the project description and need. We moved project. We moved it under project readiness. Um, Marketing plan includes the take rate, and we know that the take rate is always subjective. Um, but we want to know why you think this is, why you think the take rate is, what it's going to be, um, and, and in addition to it, how do you think you're going to achieve that take rate? You know, so what is your marketing plan? Are you going to run ads in the local paper? Are you going to send flyers home to the through the schools? Um, you know, are you knocking on doors? Let us know what your marketing plan is. And in addition, um, the, 
what we're asking for you this year is um, what are your digital literacy efforts? Now these efforts can be both by the locality or the co-applicant or joint or we could, you know, maybe your libraries are going to put in some digital literacy efforts or your co-ops, um, you know, so tell us what you're doing to help get broadband out to your citizens. And then not changed from last year is the uh, details on the project management team. You know, we want to know who's going to be working on this. Um, and, you know, do you guys have, you know, are you used to running grants um, and other projects such as this sort? So that is what I have. Um, oh, and also under uh, details on project management team, uh, this is where you're going to put the letters of support. So if you're a regional project, you know, we want to make sure that the locality that you're doing the joint project with knows and understands. And so this is where you put the letter of support saying, you know, uh, County A is um, going to run the grant for us in County B, and they have our support to do that. Um, so, and, you know, if you're a multi-regional one, we really do need letters of support from all the localities uh, in the project area. And um, also, this is a great place to put letters of anyone providing match or leverage other than the applicant or co-applicant. Um, so maybe, you, you know, the applicant is putting in a little bit of cash, the co-applicant is putting in more cash, but you might have, um, like I said, the IDA or the EDA putting in additional funds on top of that. Um, those letters saying that they would um, provide, you know, the, the, the match there is where you would put these letters of support. All right, next slide. Um, so uh, this is the project budget and cost appropriateness. Uh, again, this hasn't changed um, with what we're asking for. Um, we're asking for the derivation of cost sheet and the documentation of supporting costs. Um, the derivation of costs, um, kind of break it out by what category, whether it's construction, whether it's admin, whether it's um, permits, easements. Um, those are the things we're looking for in derivation of costs. There is going to be a sample on the, or um, a template on the uh, CAMS application that you guys can use um, the documentation of supporting cost estimates. This is where we're looking for you guys um, to provide you know, a more itemized. Um, some people provide uh, costs from their suppliers. Some people uh, write letters saying that they're familiar, you know, they, they've been in business X, Y, Z, number of years. Um, they can't provide actual costs because of um, confidential agreements with their suppliers, but uh, this is where they've been, you know, they know that these costs are complete and accurate at that point. Um, and then the cost benefit index, that is, um, it's, a, it's comprised of three factors. It's the uh, total VATI funding request, uh, the number of serviceable units, and then the highest residential speed available in the proposed project. And um, it's a relative index score that, um, that averages together the three components, which is state share for the total cost, uh, project cost, plus state cost per unit pass, plus internet speed. Um, and then it's converted to um, a 60-point scale this year. Last year it was on a 30-point scale. So um, since all the components of the cost benefit index are relative to the respective averages of all projects, composite cost benefit index is also a relative score compared to the specific average of all projects. So that's why it's on the 60 point scale. Um, a higher score indicates a greater cost benefit, benefit relative to lower scores. And um, so that's that. Next slide, please. So um, a category that we added last year and we're providing more information on right now is the uh, Commonwealth Priorities. 
So we're looking here for the, how does the project fit into a larger plan for universal coverage. Um, do you have any significant businesses or community anchors or other passings in the project area? Um, then details on unique partnerships. Um, and then any digital equity efforts you guys are doing in the project areas. Um, that we haven't really talked about, um, but are, re are part of this project is um, the form of 477 or equivalent for the last two years does need to be attached. Um, and then additionally, you have uh, the ability to do four additional attachments um, to, you know, to the application. Um, one thing else I did not um, mention, but want to mention to you guys as we round this up, um, as to the different um, the different uh, areas of the application, is um, you know don't think a project is too big or too small um, to apply for the body grant. Just to let you know. In 2020, um, the range of passings was the lowest um, passings was 387, and the highest number of passings was 22,690, and everything you know, and everything in between. In addition, there's no magic cost per passing number either. Um, the range was the lowest was 105 and three cents to the highest being, you know, just under three thousand dollars cost per passing. So, you know, don't, you know, if you have a smaller area, don't count yourself out. And if you have a larger area, don't count yourself out either, because it, we take a lot of factors into consideration when we score these applications. So, um, again. It, you know, if you have questions or concerns, please reach out to us. Um, you know, there is a whole range of, you know, applications that come through. And, you know, they're all successful in their own right. So um, that is what I have um, application itself. And now we're going to move into going into CAMS. So, um, this is the DHCD website, uh, which is www. Or D, it's dhc.virginia.gov. And once you go to the home page, up at top you'll see Access Cams, and uh, you'll click on that. And next page. Um, create a profile now if you don't have one. And the profiles are going to be the localities, the applicants. Not the co-applicants do not need to create a profile. Um, if the co-applicants want to see the questions, if you go to the body website and click on our program guidelines and criteria, um, there's the um, 24 page document that lists all the questions there. Those questions uh, from page, sorry, I'm flipping papers. Um, from page 13 to page 16 are the exact same questions that are going to be in CAMS. So the, um, the profile should be for the applicant who is going to be the locality. And so um, don't share your password and login. Um, you can go in, once you're in, you can go in and assign staff roles for assistance if needed. Um, you could assign um, a staff role to your co-applicant just to see all of your applications and projects in there if you do that. So you need to make that decision as to what's best for your locality. Um, Internet Explorer or Chrome are going to be your, your recommended and I can't say this often enough, and you'll see it here in the next couple of slides. Save often. Um, again, you save this tab before moving on to another section. 
but also make sure you have put something in all the required fields uh, because if you don't and you try to save, it will not save any. So um, in the next slide is what a profile would look like. Um, you have your organization name, your address, um, who the director or person in charge is, um, and then you'd add your staff information there. As you can see, um, you have profile manager, you have organizational head, and there are plenty of other um, different uh, titles for the CAMS user role that you can use. And there should be on CAMS a user's guide that can tell you some of the different roles out there. Next slide, please. All right, so once you're in, you are going to do um, a search program, and you're going to look for, this is uh, two years ago, this is the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative dash 2019, Virginia Telecommunications Initiative 2019. You will see the 2021 uh, there instead, and that is the application you want to use. Um, the application will open up no later than next Monday. Um, so if you go in there right now today, you will not see it. Uh, it should open up by Monday. Um, and then you need to fill out, you um, for body of the infrastructure and, you know, what kind of el eligible organization you are. And then you'll hit go and you'll go to the next slide. And this is where you're going to start your application. So you're going to start by putting in your project information, um, you know, your organizational name, who the primary project, primary contact is going to be. And that's very important that you put um, the correct person because that is the person we are probably going to uh, reach out to if there are any questions or concerns. Um, the and then the primary service area. You you do have to fill out either county, city, or town. Um, and you can add and edit as many as you need to. You'll get a little drop box or a little click box to pick out the different um, areas. And then next. Um, then you'll get to your budget um, information. And as you can see, um, You'll have a little uh, next to cost slash activity category. You'll see telecommunications. If you click on that little button, it will open it up for some different categories to put in there. Um, and then you'll also have, um, you know, the, the budget narrative. So you do need to fill that out. And next tab. All right, and then the narrative and information. This is where you will answer these questions. And so um, if a map needs to be attached or a, a, um, anything needs to be attached, it will tell you what needs to be attached, how to label it. Um, you are somewhat limited on the characters. I don't know what the character limitation is off the top of my head. Be careful when you are cutting and pasting from a Word document. Um, because if you have spaces and returns at the end of the sentences, it can add a lot of um, it can add a lot of uh, spaces when we try to download the application. Uh, so just be aware of that as you answer these questions first, maybe in um, a, another program before you transfer them over. Um, again, save often. Um, the form of like, you know, answer one question, hit save, answer another question, hit save, because you'd hate to answer all 13 questions and forget to hit save and then have to go back and redo all 13 questions. And again, this seems to be very um, evident if you do not use Internet Explorer or Chrome. And then... Um, Um, another thing that I didn't mention, but you are going to have to name your application and, or, or your um, or your project 
Um, please be aware as to what you are naming your application. If you are submitting multiple applications, please don't name them XXX Broadband Body 2021 and label the next one XXS Body Application 2021. Um, please, please use a little bit of uh, some nomenclature where you know, X County, X area, body 2021. You know, something that identifies it and makes it a little bit unique for everybody um, so that we understand which project we're looking at because uh, if you do have multiple applications, they sometimes run together in our brains um, after looking at you know, 30 plus of them. So by delineating them on the project name, it helps us remember which project we're looking at. Mira? Okay. There we go. This is the list of the required attachments. Um, so you'll need a map of the project area, including the proposed infrastructure. Uh, you'll need the documentation of federal funding, um, the documentation that the proposed project area is unserved, uh, the passing form, um, which any template will be uh, uh, available through CAMS for you guys. Um, then five, if you are doing a wireless project, we do need a propagation map. Um, the timeline slash project management plan, a copy of that MOU, MOA, we understand that it most likely will be in draft form and not signed. Um, but we do want to see what you guys are looking at. Um, the documentation for matching funds, the derivation of costs, the um, documentation of supporting project costs, which are the vendor quotes, and again, the two most recent Form 477s or equivalent. And then you still have the ability to put four additional attachments um, on there. So when you upload the attachments, um, you'll go to the attachment page, and you'll hit Choose File, and you will upload the PDF version of that file, labeled as we have asked you to, in the application and so um, again make sure you save and um, so that's it on the attachments in the next page um, as Samara stated um, applications are due August 17th 2020 you everything must come in through PAMS um, including all required um, attachments um, Stay in office until five o'clock um, on that day. So you probably will not get anybody after five o'clock. So um, we tried to do it before the holiday weekend this year, so we wouldn't ruin anybody's holidays. And um, I can't think of anything else at this time. I'm sure I've forgotten stuff, and I apologize for that. But I think we are. Um, so I got the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, last year, we had um, Freedom of Information Act exemption requests. Um, that policy has not changed. Uh, the biggest thing that we want to remind everybody on is um, do not submit any of the documents that you are requesting to be um, exempt from FOIA until DHCD has provided a written determination. And I believe we have um, to reply to a request. Um, so up until that time of you guys getting an answer back from DHCD, those um, documents that you do send could potentially be um, FOIA. So if you have any questions about our policies, we are here to answer any questions with regards to that. Um, but you know, make the request first. And if granted the exception, then those documents can be submitted. In, um, next question, or next slide, please. All right, I, I believe I have Carolyn at this time. 
uh, to talk about some tips and tricks, and um, I think then she's on to questions. So, Carolyn, are you available? Yep, thanks, Tammy. Okay, okay. guys, just some uh, quick tips. Um, and I saw this was one of the questions already, and we'll get to the questions here in a minute. But um, so for multiple applications, we received a number of comments regarding this issue, and an applicant can submit one application with multiple providers if the applicant can demonstrate how the providers are working together to achieve universal coverage. Um, if the applicant and the multiple private private partners um, are working separately, so the unit of local government has multiple private partners, but they're not really working together in the project area, then in that case, the applicant would need to submit separate applications for each private partner. Um, and of course, providers are allowed to submit separate applications with different units of local government. Um, Tammy really hit on this, um, but just to remind you, uh, be sure to leverage any federal funds or local resources. Um, again, for the purposes of VADI, we're defining leverage as non-match cash or non-match in-kind resources committed to a proposed project that do not qualify as match or being used as match. Um, so applicants that have been awarded federal funds cannot use those funds as match. However, they are encouraged to leverage their federal award with VADI funds to extend service to areas beyond those that receive the federal funds. Um, and this and any applicant that can do this may score higher in the project readiness category. Um, like Tamara had mentioned, the uh, public notice requirement has been changed this year to the VADI notice of application. Um, all applicants are required to issue a notice of application to DHCD no later than July 13th. We'll then post these notices to the DHCD VADI webpage no later than July 17th. And the whole goal of the, the notice process is to help facilitate these conversations between a unit of local government and its incumbent provider and all in the hopes of uh, preventing a, a potential challenge. Um, there is a sample notice included in the guidelines and the main information you wanna be sure to include is the name of the unit of local government a summary description of the project to be funded, the approximate proposed project area, the primary point of contact, including the mailing address, phone number, and email address, and um, the, the private provider's name is actually optional. So um, you are not required to actually name your private partner. Um, and then as, as Tammy had hit on, be sure to be thorough in your responses to the narrative questions and uh, really name your attachments with um, something that's a little more descriptive of what it is and for what project. Um, save often while working in CAM so you don't lose any of your, your narrative questions. And um, if you have any issues, be sure to call DHCD. Uh, we're, we're here to help whether it be with issues with CAMS or if you just need some help talking through a project, um, reach out to us and, and you know, we want to make sure that these projects get submitted and are successful. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Okay, so um, we're going to go through a little Q&A. Uh, for those of you who are on the phone, I'll, I'll open it up to you guys in just a minute. However, if you're joining us on the web, please be sure to, if you haven't done so already, type in your question over in the chat box. I'm going to go through some of these questions and Tammy and Tamara can help me answer these. Um, first off, the slides will be available on the, the VADI website after the webinar. Um, so we have a question, how is the service overlap determined? 
Tammy or Tamara, do you want to answer that one? Tammy, do you want to take that one? Sure, sorry, I'm unmuted and trying to unmute myself. Um, again, that is the legwork of the applicant and or the co-applicant to do. Um, you know, there are various sources to try to find out, you know, what providers are in your area, what services they're offering. Um, you know, the hope is that you are also in discussions with any incumbents in your area, whether they be wireline or wireless, um, because, you know, an overlap uh, application will have a challenge, and you know, the goal is not to have an area challenge. The goal is to have an area service. So, um, unfortunately, it's a little bit of legwork. We can provide um, you know some resources. Uh, there are some websites out there, um, but again, a lot of that data may be lagging a little bit behind. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, it is on, you know, the applicant and the co-applicant to do some of that legwork to figure out that overlap. And I will just add that, um, honestly, in some instances, if a locality or co-applicant cannot determine the overlap, because that is a question, um, it's the estimated overlap. So um, you would, you know, as Tammy said, do your due diligence with trying to get as much information locally as possible, hopefully talking to your incumbent, but um, I don't want to say worst case scenario, in the event that, you know, a locality puts an over estimated overlap and they don't kind of hit the mark, there could most likely be a challenge from an incumbent who will challenge the project. And then you can kind of get an understanding of the overlap. I mean, it'd be great if you can figure it out exactly, but that's why we asked for the estimated overlap. Um, because again, the goal of Vati is to focus on areas that are unserved um, within the Commonwealth. So we hope that answers your question. Okay, next we have um, a comment rather than a question um, from Sean Meredith. He says, I'm a district coordinator in the office of the representative Spamberger. If you are applying for a grant that has federal funds attached and will have an effect in the seventh district, please reach out about a potential letter of support. And he lists his email address there. Um, it's sean.meredith at mail.house.gov. Thank uh, you very much. Sure. Uh, so the next question, is the sample passings form available for download somewhere? Yes, that will be on uh, the CAMS uh, application. Uh, if you need it um, outside the application, you can send an email. Um, and anytime you have any questions, the email address is vati at dhcd.virginia.gov with Virginia spelled out. Um, that is manned by all the broadband team staff. And so um, anytime you have any questions, concerns, um, that is the email to use. But all the templates will be on uh, the CAMS application. Okay, um, next question. The FCC funding eligibility maps are still based on census blocks. Is there a way to identify what areas are below 25 by three without actually having to sign up for wireless services from each provider and driving the county to take speed tests? customer provided input may or may not be accurate or factual. So I'll take this one. So we do know, as, as I shared earlier, regarding the RDOF, um program, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, those blocks that are that have been announced by the FCC, and they, just so you know, they did have a public comment period that closed in April. So some of the blocks that they announced in March may no longer be a part of the bid process because some folks, including some of our own Vati awardees, have challenged um, some of those census blocks that have been have been bid or are planned to be bid in Virginia. So the the I mean the if you want to use a data set um, and not that we're co-signing or advocating to use the FCC data um, again we're we're trying to get folks to find out local data and talk to their incumbents uh, if you are. Are you, if you're going to look at an FCC data set, 
the most recent data set as of March of 2019 is the art off and that those are eligible census blocks that are 25 over three and below. So this question asked about the funding eligibility maps and right now the only updated maps on the FCC website is for the art off program. Um, there also may be some providers that may be willing to share information with you again reach out to the VASI team, ask questions. We've had this program since 2017. We, we have good relationships with many folks within the private sector. So reach out to us. Um, we, we often joke we're, we're on a webinar now, but if we were in person and we were in a room, we would be making a, a, a eHarmony connection between a provider and a locality. Because um, sometimes localities are looking for partners and sometimes providers are looking for partners as well. Um, so again, reach out to us and we can also make connections between a unit of local government as well as um, a local as a, uh, as well as a provider. Yeah, and uh, Tamara, this is Evan. I, I just want to add, you know, the, the reason we emphasize uh, reaching out to your incumbent providers early is uh, so that you can kind of avoid this issue. So, you know, they would rather not, right? They just want to keep doing their business. And so, they would rather not have to muck around with submitting a challenge and then proving it to DHCD staff. You as a as an applicant ought to reach out to them and say, hey, if you don't tell me where you are, I'm going to wind up overlapping your coverage area. So why don't you come in and help us tailor this project so that you don't need to submit a challenge? That's easier for everybody. Uh, we're aware that the, the 477 data is bad. The way to get around that is to uh, is this challenge process. And so if you as the applicant reach out to the incumbent providers and say, look, let's just avoid you having to do a challenge through DHCD at all, come into the office or you go to their office and get them to tell you where they are and then tailor your uh, project area to come right up to the edge of it. And that I think is the best approach. Thank you, Evan. Okay, next question. It says, can the 10% matching funds be based on existing infrastructure we are leveraging to expand into these unserved areas or does it have to be strictly cash? So the 10%, um, so VATI actually has a 20% match overall of which we, this year's program under the enabling language added by the General Assembly, the private sector provider um, has to have some skin in the game. And we've set that line at 10%. So the 10% is actually the, the, the line for the provider. Um, the matching funds, I mean, it just depends. I mean, I would say definitely reach out to the team that the private sector provider has to have cash. The locality could potentially leverage, let's say if you all have some towers that you already have in the locality, or let's say a locality built out a middle mile and they want to leverage that. Um, I'd say definitely reach out to the team. Um, it's also based on the timing of the original investment, um, if it can be used as match. Um, and most likely if it's already existing infrastructure, it'll be more of an in-kind match as opposed to a cash match. Um, but again, the 10%, that line of demarcation is for the, for the private provider. They can do more than the 10%, but at a, at a minimum of 10%. Okay. If an applicant is planning a multi-year project in conjunction with other localities in a regional proposal, how would that be presented? Is the future project a leverage item? Could you share how you might evaluate such a long-term segmented plan? All right, Tammy, I'm going to let you explain because I know we have one the last round. Okay, so um, what you would do is you tell us your overall uh, process and then you tell us what your different phases are. Um, we, are we would actually evaluate um, phase one for funding, looking at you know, the proposed project um, that's where like the Commonwealth priorities of the Universal Broadband Plan um, would come in there. However, you are not guaranteed funds for year two or three. You still have to come back in uh, for that next phase, that next round. Um, and again, there's no guaranteeing of funding through that. But in that second year application, you would talk about your 
first, you know, your first phase that was you know, awarded and or completed and that you still got an additional phase to go. Um, so that's how we evaluate that. Um, the best option is to give us a call. We can set up a meeting to talk over your specific um, uh, details and try to help you tailor your application uh, to the best application that you guys can have. Um, to me, this is more something that we should have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with. So, you know, you can get all your partners involved, all your, um, your co-applicants involved. And that's a discussion that I, I think we should have at a different time to discuss your specific uh, situations. And that goes for anybody who has a similar question. And as Evan said earlier, and I think Tammy said earlier as well, don't be discouraged if you do have a large scale, you know, multi-phase project. Again, reach out to the team, talk to us. There was a similar project that came in last round. Um, and if you get a chance to look at the Vati website, you'll be able to see that application where they actually came in for, for three years in three different phases. And then we were able to have a TA session with them. Um, and then part of the project was, was able to be awarded funding through the Vati program. So again, um, reach out to the team and have a technical assistance call with us. Okay, um, can you have multiple projects with multiple applications, different cities, entities? Um, and I, I touched on this in, the, in my last slide, um, but yes, you can have multiple projects and multiple applications. If, if you have multiple private providers being a unit of local government having multiple private partners, if they are collaborating together and working together, then you can submit them on one application. However, if they are working on two different projects, working separately, then you would need to come in with, with separate applications for each, each provider. And then of course the providers are allowed to sub be co-applicants on multiple different applications. And the key word there, what Caroline said earlier is, They've got to explain how they're working together collaboratively. Remember, Vati lets you take multiple non-contiguous non areas and make it an overall project. So you could have multiple providers in different parts of your locality or your region, and you're pulling them all together in one application. You have to explain how, how they're working collaboratively together. If you have a project and it's in the northeast part of the county and you've got another project and it's in the northwest part of the county, and they're, they're not contiguous, which we figured that it is, but the providers in no form or fashion are working together at all, that's gonna be hard to substantiate that that's a, a singular project, and maybe that should have came in with two different applications. So again, at any point in time, if you have any questions, reach out to the team um, and talk through through project development. Uh, let's see, will will a sample draft MOU or MOA be available and shared? Yes, we have um, one that we can uh, share. Just send that request to the body email address and we can send that to you. We do have an archive of our previous uh, winning applications on our uh, website. And those, they might have um, some of those up there also that you guys can look at. Um, additionally, you know, there are so many uh, broadband authorities and other localities that are doing um, these things that, you know, I, you, I think you guys have some networks out there that you might be able to reach out to um, other localities and say, hey, I saw that you uh, won an award. How did you guys do this? Do you mind if I look at what you're doing? Um, everybody usually is very willing to share uh, what they've done and sometimes even lessons learned uh, during these applications. Um, but, you know, you know, reach out to us. We do have a sample, um, but there are lots of other resources out there too. Okay, how is the letter of intent submitted in CAMS or emailed? Are we held to grant amount stated in the letter of, in, of, letter of intent? So I'll take this one. Um, the letter, and it's actually a notice of application, um, and it is emailed to the Vati email address by the due date, which I'm pretty sure is July 17th. I think I said that right. Um, 
And then you, we've actually removed the grant amount from the notice of application. If you looked at the earlier draft of the guidelines that we put out in April, it did have an estimate, estimated grant amount. We've since removed that based on comments through the public comment period. So um, they're due on July 17th and they should be emailed to the VATI email address. And remember, you must submit a VATI notice of application um, otherwise, you will not be eligible to submit an application in August. Just a reminder, and I know I saw that in the chat box somewhere. Um, but you email it to the Vati email address, which is on the slide that's up on the screen and um, is also on our website as well. Next question is, can we also leverage previous VATI grant with different ISP for this new VATI work area? If we can show that this new area fills a gap that other ISP can't reach or well reach. So I'll take that one. Um, yes, you can leverage. You cannot use it as match. Remember, and that's why we had a new question to the to the CAMS application is, you know, what are you leveraging? So yes, you can use prior infrastructure put in with Vati, as long as the other ISP is willing to, you know, let you utilize that infrastructure. Um, but it will not be considered your your match, because remember, there's a 20% match requirement for Vati, 10%, at least 10% have to come from the private provider, but you can't use it as match. So if you put a tower up with a, with a prior Vati project, you cannot use that as match for this grant. You can use, use it as leverage. So it's a non-cash match or non in kind resource. Okay, and Tamara, you kind of answered the next question too. Can federal funds be used as matching funds? Um, no federal funds can be used as, as match. I do see that messages from Cynthia Church, who's with the Library of Virginia. So Cynthia, it just depends on, on the federal funding. If it's CAF2 or ACAM or Reconnect or Community Connect, we do not allow those funds to be used as match funds. I do know, if I'm not mistaken, the Library of Virginia may have some funds that can help localities. So we'd say just have localities reach out to us to discuss other types of federal funding because um, they may be able to be leveraged. They may not be able to use them as match, but they may be able to use it as leverage. Tamara, it looks like she... Cindy just responded as well, and it looks like she's specifically talking about CARES Act funds. Um, hmm. Is Evan still on the phone? I might have to ask Evan to talk about the CARES Act funds. Right now, as far as we know, and Kyle's on the phone as well, it's our understanding that the CARES Act fund is not being used for construction. So I don't, yeah, I don't I know which way folks would use that as, as match. And the timing is, is through December. Tamara, hey, I, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, the so you know there's a lot of different buckets that came out uh, under the CARES Act, but if you're talking about the the local CARES Act funding, uh, there's not as much guidance on that as we would like. But uh, the Treasury did attempt to address the question, uh, and I'll just read it to people. May recipients uh, actually I'll post it in the chat box, uh, but it's may recipients use fund payments to expand rural broad broadband capacity to assist with distance learning and telework. Such expenditures would only be, now this is the Treasury answering that, such expenditures would only be permissible if they are necessary for the public health emergency. The cost of projects that would not be expected to increase capacity to a significant extent until the need for distance learning and telework have passed due to this health emergency would not be necessary due to the public health emergency and thus would not be eligible uses of fund payments. So that's that's purely in response to a question about the local bit. Uh, the uh, First, I'm not sure why Treasury is of the view that uh, the, the public health emergency will certainly be passed in the next few months. Uh, but, but second, I, I still think at the end of the day, the thing that folks need to look at in terms of uses of CARES Act funds is the totality of guidance from the Treasury and consultation with their local council. Uh, one of the things that has been a frustration for us is that uh, we are not able to uh, give you guys 
advice as to how to interpret the federal law. Um, we aren't your attorneys and you can't rely on us as such. And as a result, you know, I, I can share that piece of guidance that came from the Treasury that says, you know, it's got to be relevant to this public health emergency for the public funds. For the other funds, that's for the other CARES Act funding. That's a different question. Uh, but ultimately, the thing to do is for local governments or state agencies to talk to your council and say, share with them the, the, the guidance from Treasury and say, what do you think we can do? Um, and that's all, you know, I, I wish I could say more, but I, I really can't. Okay. Um, next question is, is the 10% matching funds of private provider to be cash? And it looks like Kyle has already responded to this one, for, but for the sake of people on the phone, um, DHCD will consider less than 10% private funds if the co-applicant can demonstrate why it is less. Um, okay, so I'm looking through, it looks like that's about it in the chat box. Um, is there anyone else on the phone that has any questions? I don't, I don't hear anyone unless it's taking them a little while to come off mute. Um, so unless there's any questions, we have um, on the slide up there, we have all of the contact information. And like, like everyone has said repeatedly, please feel free um, to contact us for any sort of assistance. It looks like we've had a few more questions come in. Um, when will this, when will the recording of this call be available? So, yeah, maybe. so the slides and the, uh, the presentation and the webinar recording, um, I would say no later than Monday, we'll submit it to our website folks to get it updated on our page. So um, just anticipate both the application and the website being updated with the recording and the slides by Monday. Okay. Um, let's see. So Claire Collins says, I still do not have a clear answer to private provider matching fund questions. Um, so I saw that earlier. Um, so the private provider has to, this was added to the enabling language from Ozzy, has to provide a cash match. We've set the bar at 10%. And as Kyle has answered in the, in the chat box, that if a provider is going to put um, less than 10% as cash match in the project. Um, definitely reach out to us if you have any questions regarding that. I um, mean, it's really around the scope, um, the density of the project, the return on investment, because um, sometimes 10% may not be doable as a cash match. So definitely reach out to the team regarding that. But yes, per the enabling language, the private provider has to have cash on the table and we set that bar at 10%. Um, and then there was a question from Gary regarding the 10%. Um, well, there's a 20% match requirement, Gary. The 10% is required by the private provider. And then the remainder of the match, whether it's a minimum of, you know, additional 10%, bringing you to the minimum required for Vati at 20%. Um, Tammy, do you have any stats? I don't know if you have them in front of you of what the ranges of match were from the last round. I think it went from 20 up to 80% or something like that. So, I'm sorry, that was me. I hit the wrong um, microphone. I apologize. So, last year, the applications came in from 20% to 88%. The winning awards were from 25% match to 88% match. So, I'm not um, stating this at the beginning, um, as Tamara said. Um, DHCD can fund a maximum of 80% of the project. 20% of the project has to come from either cash match, in-kind match, um, and then the enabling language, enabling language says that a provider has to have um, a cash match, and DHCD has set that bar at 10%. So 
the application itself can only ask for 80% of the overall project. Um, DHCD wants to see a minimum of 10% come from the provider because of how the enabling language is. If the provider has does more than 10%, that's awesome. If they have to, if they can't do 10%, um, DHCD needs to, and then that additional funds has to equal a minimum of 20% match. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, I don't, I don't see any more questions. Hey, Caroline. Yep. Hey, Kyle. Um, do you mind talking about the VLBN webinar that's going to happen on June sixteenth? I saw that Carol had mentioned something about the CARES Act funding. Um, just so folks on the on the webinar know about it. Sure. Um, and for anyone who's not on the VLBN, and um, just a little bit of background information, the VLBN stands for the Virginia Local Broadband Network, and it's uh, it consists of Virginia localities, schools, and libraries, and it's it's an interactive forum where this group of people can get together and talk about broadband related issues throughout the Commonwealth. Um, if if you want to be added to the VLBN list, please um, email me, and I will add you as soon as possible. Um, but the VLBN is having a call next week. Um, it's June 16th um, from 10 to 11. Um, and I'm in the process of getting that call in information out. Um, but we'll be discussing sort of uh, what localities are thinking as far as CARES Act allocations and how that could potentially be used towards broadband related um, projects or initiatives. Um, like, like Evan had mentioned, we're not your attorney. We're not planning on giving advice on how to spend this allocation. Uh, the, the goal of this call is um, essentially a brainstorming session. So um, we'll have other localities talking about what they're planning on doing with it or what their process, their thought process has been um, to, you know, again, this is this is an issue that everybody will be dealing with, and it's it's a big unknown at this point. So, you know, just to get these stakeholders together and kind of um, talk through it, and hopefully that will um, provide some light for others. Um, again, if if you want to be included on that VLBN list, uh, email me. And um, I'll not only add you to the list, but I'll make sure you get that call-in information as well. All right, Tamara, is there a next step slide? Nope, I just have our contact information. Okay. Um, well, then, in, in that Caroline? case, yeah. Oh, real quick, this is Jay Grant, also at DHCD. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, uh, technically can uh, be used towards MAPS for other federal programs um, and other state and local programs. But of course, the activity would have to be an eligible CDBG activity and meet a national objective. I don't know if Tamara, if you want to discuss that or if that's something that should be offline in the future, but um, that could be a potential resource as well. Sure, Jay. We can actually, um, for those localities that reach out to us, um, not every locality in the Commonwealth is eligible for community development block grant funding. Um, those of you who are eligible, you know who you are. Uh, understand that the, unlike the Vati program for CDBG, it has to be the local government is the applicant. So if you're a planning district commission or you're a school district, um, you could apply for CDBG in partnership with your locality. But for Vati, we allow a, a wider net, a, lot, a wider safety net, a wider net or, of folks that can apply. Um, but for CDBG, it has to be a locality. So definitely ask questions. Um, I know that Jay's team are talking about um, CDBG and broadband. So as you reach out to us, if you are eligible for state CDBG funding, um, let us know that as we're talking to you around project development. Um, and Jay, I guess before you go, is the CDBG funding, um, are you talking about the open submission grant program that closes in September? Um, 
honestly the open submission as well as the standard um, competitive process, we are most likely going to have a second round of competitive applications later this year. That has not been announced yet. Um, but yes, for the open submission, um, that is primarily right now addressing COVID-19 related response, um, but it could also address other either urgent needs or um, other types of standard um, open submission projects. Um, and of course, like you said, Tamara, we're talking about mostly what we consider non-entitlement areas, so mostly rural areas, um, smaller towns and localities, uh, counties outside of your uh, larger metropolitan areas. Thank you, Jay. And I guess one of the things we wanted to ask you all, because um, one of the things we were contemplating um, is potentially hosting a webinar on challenges, you know, whether you're a, a unit of local government and you've got to respond to a challenge or whether you're a challenger trying to figure out how to submit your documents or, or what you should include in the required documents for challenges. Um, as we as we talk to you all, we're going to ask you more about some, some TA around that. Um, so just think about that as you all are working on your application. Um, so we can provide some guidance. We, we provide TA just as you know from A to Z. It doesn't matter. Um, any, any question you all have, there's no um, no small question that you can ask us. So definitely reach out to the team, email the Bati email address. As, as Caroline and Tammy said, we all have access to that to respond. Um, we're here to help you. Um, Evan quotes me all the time, this is the open book test. Um, so there's no gotcha and we're here to work with you at any point in time throughout your project development phases. So with that, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up our 2021 um, Virginia Telecommunication Initiative How to Apply webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Again, if you have any questions, reach out to us. Um, don't forget your notice of application is due on July 17th. If you have any questions, please reach out. Don't July 13th, Mara. July, did I say that wrong? Yeah, July 13th. Oh gosh, July 13th. I keep saying the 17th. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm going to put that in bold letters on our webpage because I keep messing that up. Um, and on July 13th, our the notice of applications are due. Um, and again, thank you. The recording and the slides will be available by Monday. And everyone enjoy the rest of your day.